Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. Send a donation with the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Or by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Our listener's choice countdown continues, and we have reached the uh, top of our uh, short division made up of series with uh, 10 or less episodes, and the number one series is the Poirot uh, series starring Her- Harold Huber as Poirot that aired over the mutual broadcasting system in 1945 and 46. And we played this series back during our third season. Uh, this episode is originally aired November the 30th of 1945, and the title is The Bride War Fright. <laughs> Sam and the little grey cell. These will always catch the criminal. If you follow Detective Extraordinary. From the thrill-packed pages of Agatha Christie's unforgettable stories of corpses, clues, and crime, Mutual now brings you, complete with bowler hat and magnificent mustache, your favorite detective, F. U. Poirot, starring Harold Huber in The Bride War Fright. <laughs> It's good to get out. A thousand thunders. What does it cause with the lights? Ah, well, there is always the lamp. <laughs> oh, oh, please, I'm not a thief. I- I'll go out quietly. I-, I didn't take anything. I didn't really. Unless you count a cup of coffee. I-, I was so hungry. I'll pay for that. Just let me get out of here and please don't say anything about it. Oh, please, mademoiselle, give me a moment to think and let me turn on the lamp and look at you. Oh. Oh, indeed, mademoiselle. Or should I say madame? Inasmuch as you are wearing a wedding gown? No, it's not madame. That's why I'm here. Mademoiselle, I am not a minister. No, you don't understand. I I didn't get married. I ran away. They chased me, so I hid in this apartment. And how did you get in? Well, I ran in here because I saw Peter coming around the corner. I ran into the elevator and told the boy to take me to the top floor. Then I went up on the roof. I knew Peter would come after me, and so I climbed down the fire escape, and your window was open. That was most careless of me. Oh, please, you're not going to have me arrested, are you? I, I'm not a thief, really, I'm not. Mademoiselle, we will discuss that question in due time. Just now, there are many things I do not understand. Sir, you are in the costume of a bride. Where is the groom? Oh, why, that's Peter. You mean you were running away from your future husband? Yes. But please, that's something I, I don't want to talk about. May I go now? Well, you may go most certainly, Mademoiselle, but have you given thought to where you are going? In that dress, you will most certainly attract attention, and you cannot spend the remainder of the night breaking into strange apartments. I know, but I, I'm trying to get to my aunt. She'll help me. Then you are not returning to your home? Oh, no, I can't. Oh, hide me, please. No, mademoiselle, that is out of the question. Well, I'll run into the kitchen. That is useless, mademoiselle. But don't you see someone's after me? That, mademoiselle, is a possibility. But hiding will not help. Oh, please, please don't answer. I beg your pardon, but did you see anything of a girl in a wedding? Why, there you are, my dear Eleanor. Oh, what in the world did you want to run off for? You can't mean to say that I've already begun to treat you badly, even before we're married. I'm not going to marry you, Peter. It's no use. Oh, come along, dear. You're upset. I'm not leaving here. But your father's worried about you, Eleanor. You can tell father to stop worrying. I've made up my mind, Peter. Darling, think of the impression we must be making on our own country. 
Oh, he's no stranger. This is a very good friend of mine, Peter. That's why I came here. I want you to meet Mr... Hercule Poirot is the name, Melanie. Poirot? Yes, the famous detective. And it's surprising that he should suddenly have become such a great friend of yours. Monsieur, you have the advantage of me. You evidently know my name. I'm Peter Cheney. Major Peter Cheney, and... Uh, this is my fiancée, Eleanor Carlin. You mean I was your fiancée? Eleanor, stop this nonsense and come along with me. We've bothered Mr. Poirot enough. I assure you, Mr. Cheney, it is no bother. There, you hear what Mr. Poirot is saying? I'm not leaving. You don't mean to say that you intend to spend the night here. And why not? Well, <laughs> really, Eleanor, you can't expect your father or me to... Monsieur Cheney, come, come, you flatter me. I am not the man for the ladies. But Mademoiselle Carlin shall be chaperoned. Mr. Poirot, for a man of your reputation, you don't seem to understand the situation. Miss Carlin is my fiancée. Monsieur, it is you who does not understand me. This young lady evidently wishes not to be your fiancée. In addition, she seems to be frightened of you. Ridiculous. Frightened enough to run away from you on her wedding day and break into a strange apartment. She's just upset. Exactly, monsieur. And I think it is your presence that upsets her. I see. Well, I suppose I should have known... This is too good an opportunity for any uh, private detective to pass up. When you saw me and heard my name, you knew there'd be something in it for you. Uh, monsieur, I assure you, you are not very astute. Mademoiselle Carlin, would you be kind enough to telephone your aunt and ask her to stay with you? I certainly will. Now, if I give you a check for $5,000 as a retainer, will you then agree that Eleanor has been acting foolishly and let her come with me? Really, monsieur. You are an intelligent man, but with one weakness. You are evidently under the impression that money can purchase anything. Why not? The check is good, you know. I have no doubt of it, Mr. Keep it. I am not interested. Mr. Poirot, I am warning you. You're making a big mistake. Mr. Poirot, my, my aunt isn't in. She doesn't answer. In that case, mademoiselle, we shall have to find another chaperone, eh? I'm Peter Cheney, the big game hunter. Does that mean anything to you? Only that you like to kill animals, monsieur. I've spent most of the last years in South America. The war raised the devil with big game hunting in Africa. I imagine the war must have interfered considerably with your pleasure. You have my condolences, monsieur. Excuse me. Police headquarters. Stevens speaking. Ah, monsieur Stevens, I have a favor to ask of you. Oh, sure, Poirot. Anything at all short of murder? Well, this is most simple, mon ami. I wish you to spend the night with me in my apartment. I have a young lady here. And what? A girl? Stevens, you will give yourself bad blood shouting so. I want you to act as chaperone. Oh. All right, Poirot. Anything you say. And now, monsieur, if you have nothing more to say, we shall bid you good night, eh? Oh, yes. Oh, there's, there's one thing. I have the finest collection of human heads in the world. You refer, of course, to the shrunken heads of the South American Indians? Yes, precisely. I found out how to do the job. It, it, it's fascinating. My collection is very fine. I was... I was just thinking. Your mustaches would add to that collection. Hmm, an amusing fancy, monsieur. When we have more time, I must show you my scrapbook of criminals I have sent to jail. I do not believe there is a big game hunter among them. <laughs> Well, at least I'm getting a good breakfast out of this, Poirot. What's the matter? You're not eating. I am worried, mon ami. Now, look, Poirot, you've done enough for Miss Carlin already. She's going over to her aunt's this morning, and that's all there is to it. I only wish you were right, mon dieu. Monsieur Cheney will not let go so easily. Well, I still don't see what you can do about it. After all, it isn't a crime to want to marry a girl. Good morning, Mr. Poirot. Oh, Inspector Stevens. Good morning. I want to thank you for being so kind to me. Mmm, that smells good. And it is good, my dear friend. <laughs> come, come, sit down. Okay. And this time you can drink coffee and not worry about being taken for a seat, eh? <laughs> yes, monsieur? Eleanor, I'm surprised at you. To think that my daughter would disgrace me by running away from a wedding and making a public exhibition of herself is shameful. Good morning, Eleanor. Oh, Peter, you too? Oh, well, young lady... Father, I'm sorry. I know that what I did was pretty bad. I, I should have refused to go through the wedding in the first place. But, 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 but why? What possible objection can you have to Major Cheney? Only that I'm not in love with him, Father. And I should think that would be enough reason for any father not to force his marriage into any marriage. I'm sure you'll learn to love me, Eleanor. Oh, nonsense. The girl doesn't know her own mind. She, she's much too young. I'm old enough to be able to make up my own mind as to whom I want to marry. I'm over 21, and you can't make me marry anyone I don't want to. Eleanor, I want you to come home and talk this over with me reasonably. I'm sorry, Father. 
I know that Peter can ruin you financially and probably will if I don't marry him. Which ought to be reason enough why you shouldn't insist that I do. Eleanor, I want you to come home with me now. I'm sorry, Father. I'm going to live with Aunt Susan. Let Eleanor do what she wants, Roger. I, I like a girl with a mind of her own. Uh, don't worry. I'll change it. Well, that's very decent of you, Peter. And as for you, gentlemen, you meddling, interfering French busybody. Miss I'll... Josie Dolan, that I will not tolerate. I'm not French. I'm Belgian. And you, since when do the members of the New York police force interfere between a father and a daughter? Huh? Well, I... I, I Mr. Think Dolan, it... Inspector Stevens spent the evening with me as my invited guest, which is a good deal more than I can say for either yourself or Monsieur Cheney. His presence here was in a friendly, not an official capacity. Come along, Roger. I don't think we're wanted. Oh, by the way, Inspector, if anything should happen to Mr. Poirot, anything violent, I mean, I trust that you will then be present in your official capacity. Good day, gentlemen. <laughs> Good afternoon, Pancho. Peter in. Ah, oh, I will see if the major is in. You may as well tell him, Pancho, that I'm going to sit right here until he sees me. I hear you, Donna. I'll be right with you. Oh, darling, take your time. As long as I know you're here, I'm happy. Donna, darling, I'd never keep you waiting. You know that. Oh, Peter, I knew it wasn't true. <laughs> and if you think that was a mistake, here. Yeah. All right, Pancho. <laughs> Down, Murphy. Down, I say. Oh, you brought me to with you. Where I go, he goes. He's well named, Donna. Muerte. You know. I know. Death. Right. I told you not to come here. Uh, Peter, I just had to. I couldn't believe that you were going to marry that girl. I am. And now that you know it, you can go right back to South America. Oh, Peter, why? Why? Why do you want to marry her? I assume you asked me that because I never wanted to marry you. You're just like all stupid women. Donna, I'm through with you. You shan't marry her, Peter, because I'm not through with you. Donna, you don't know what you're saying. No, yes, I do. You're not going to marry her, do you hear? Because if you do, I'll go to the police. I'll tell them about Juan. Remember Juan, Peter? He was tied to a tree and torn to pieces by a dog. That dog might have been Muerte. Poor Muerte. He gets blamed for everything. And what about that Englishman? What was his name? Gibson, that's it. He died of a broken neck. You're very good with a bull with Peter. An expert, aren't you? You'd actually go to the police and tell them, Donna? I will. I swear I will if you kick me out. Donna, you... You really love me. Well, uh, we'll have to be careful, but we can arrange something. Anything, Peter. Anything you say. I'll tell you what. Tonight I have something urgent to attend to. Uh, you meet me in Central Park late. About, oh, say, 2.30, near the reservoir. Why so late? Are you... Because I won't be through until then. Peter, if this is one of your tricks, I'll tell the police everything I know. Oh, don't be foolish, Donna. If you'll just meet me, I assure you that won't be necessary. Easy now, Muerte. Easy. Wait, boy. Wait. Oh, Peter, where are you? There she is, Murphy. Get her. Get her, boy. Drive her towards me. Murphy, quiet. Heel, boy, heel. Good dog. That's a fine dog. Come on, boy. Now we can go home. <laughs> That's the way we found her, Poirot. Lying in the bushes near the reservoir with her neck broken like that. Ah, the pauvre petite. This is a most singular affair, Stephen. The manner in which the neck is broken gives one furiously to think, that's that. Somebody awfully powerful must have gotten hold of her. Perhaps, but if that is true, mon ami, where are the marks of Cato? Hmm? Hey, all right, Poirot. She must have been hit with something. Exactly, mon ami, but with what? Tell me, what was her name? Donna Moreno. She just got in from South America yesterday. Oh, good morning, Inspector. Good morning, good morning. Mr. Poirot. Good morning. Well, this is my first visit to a police headquarters. Uh, uh, the policeman downstairs said I'd find you up here, Inspector. What do you want? 
Well, I read the papers this morning. I think I may know this girl who was so unfortunately killed last night. And so you came down here to give your knowledge to the police? That's right, monsieur. That was most kind of you, Monsieur Cheney. Oh, not at all. I knew that sooner or later the police would find out that Don and I had been very good friends, and so I thought I'd better trot right over here and tell everything I know. Do you know anything about this killing? Oh, nothing about the killing, of course, Inspector. Uh, Donna had a lot of friends in South America, and... A few enemies, too. Did you know that Mademoiselle Donna was coming to New York? I hadn't the slightest idea of that. We said goodbye in Rio. Did you see Mademoiselle Donna before last night? As a matter of fact, I did. She, uh, she called on me yesterday afternoon. And you had a quarrel? Oh, nothing could be further from the truth. She'd heard about my unfortunate experience at my wedding, and... And she came to sympathize with me. It is terrible, Lesper, that such a fine, sympathetic young lady should have met death in such a horrible manner. It's awful that she died at all, but uh, tell me, how did poor Donna die? Her neck was broken by some instrument. Snapped like a matchstick. Mrs. Cheney, do you know anything about the bullwhips used by some of the gauchos in South America? Oh, I should say I do. Why, I'm an expert with a whip myself. That is most interesting, Monsieur. I'll say it is. Now, this girl died about 2.30 this morning. Just where were you last night, Major Cheney? I thought you might ask me that, so I took the liberty of bringing my servant, Pancho, with me. Oh, Pancho. See me, you. Uh, Pancho, tell these gentlemen where I was last night. Uh, Major Cheney, have you been at home and never left the house? I sat with him in the library until midnight. I don't care about midnight. Where was he at 2.30? Major Cheney was in bed, asleep. You have no way of knowing that? You can tell me he went into his room, but you can't swear that he stayed there. If it is permitted to contradict the inspector... Go right ahead, Pancho. Tell the truth. I sleep in the same room with the Major. I uh, am a very light sleeper. I would have noticed if the Major had left during the night. He did not. You're willing to swear to that? I do not make the statement which are not the truth. Oh, well, uh, gentlemen, I think that's all. Uh, Take care of yourself, Mr. Poirot. Evidently, there are some dangerous people loose in this town. For the first time, Monsieur Cheney, I find myself in complete agreement with you. Do you mind if I sit down, Eleanor? Oh, oh. Peter, I wish you'd leave me alone. Aren't you tired of working, Eleanor? You, you don't have to, you know. I like working. And inasmuch as I only have an hour for lunch, I'm sure you'll forgive me if I start Oh, of course, of course. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't bother about hurrying back to the office if I were you. I certainly don't intend to be late. Oh, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you work for the Lee Construction Company, don't you? Why, yes, I do, but... I have an idea that they're not going to require your services after today. So you managed to get them to fire me? Yes, Eleanor. And I'm telling you that I'll do the same with every job you get or try to get. I, I like a woman who fights, but... I like to show them I can fight, too. Oh, Peter, I don't want to fight. I, I just want you to leave me alone. <laughs> you know this is going to be fun. When I was in South America, I think I enjoyed the thrill of tracking an animal more than the, the actual kill. Peter, this isn't the game with me. I'm not going to marry you, and I'm not going to be tracked like any animal. No? Well, what are you going to do? I'll see that you don't get a job, you have no money, and you're too proud to take any from your aunt. You see, Eleanor... I have the advantage of knowing your weakness. I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll... You'll marry me. Eventually. Morrow, I've sat in your apartment many times when we were working on a case, but I've never known as much as I do now and yet felt as helpless. Then you do know the murderer of Mademoiselle Moreno, mon ami. Sure, don't you? Yes, it is a certainty. And the devil of it is, we can't do a thing. I don't dare arrest that Cheney guy. I haven't got a case. That phony alibi is perfect. No alibi is perfect, mon brat. Monsieur Cheney is a murderer and he must be punished. Yeah, yeah, but how? Poirot, I tell you, the DA wouldn't even take the case to court. What have we got to go on? Well, the fact that Monsieur Cheney knows Mademoiselle Moreno, the fact that she visited him on the afternoon of her death, and the fact that Monsieur Cheney is an expert with a bullwhip, the weapon by which Mademoiselle Moreno was killed. Yeah, but all that's the flimsiest kind of circumstantial evidence. Put all that against his alibi, and we're licked. Uh, in this instance, Monsieur Stevens, I agree with you, huh? Good afternoon, Mr. Poirot. Hello, Inspector Cheney. Good afternoon, Mr. <laughs> Seems I come running to your apartment every time I'm in trouble. Yeah, Mademoiselle Carlin, it is a pleasure to have your company. 
Although the inspector and myself regret that you are in difficulty. Oh, Peter again. He won't let me alone. But I, I don't suppose you're interested in hearing about my trouble. But indeed we are very much interested. Now, careful, Poirot. I don't want to get sued for libel. That's something this Cheney guy is perfectly capable of doing. You mean Peter's in trouble with the police? That is just the point, mademoiselle. Monsieur Cheney is not in trouble, but he should be. Why? What has he done? Well, what has he been doing to annoy you? Well, he's gotten me fired for my job and threatened to keep me from working. And he seems perfectly able to do it. Because if Stephen, this Cheney must be checked. Yeah, but how? What has he done? He's a murderer, mademoiselle. Of that we are perfectly certain. But he is diabolically clever. He has found a simple way of committing murder so that we know he has done it, and yet we cannot prove it in a court of law. Now, please don't tell anybody, Miss Carlin. Oh, no. I can't tell you how we're going to handle him, though. He has an unbreakable alibi. Well, I mean, he has, therefore we must break it. And I think I know how. Well, are you going to let me in on this? No, certainly, mon vieux. Mademoiselle, you say that Monsieur Cheney still wants you to marry him? Yes, and it frightens me. That I can understand, mademoiselle. But that makes me believe that we can start to begin to arrive in the vicinity of somewhere. I, I beg your pardon? What, what did you say? Carlin, that means he has an idea. Exactly, mon cher Stephen. The little gray cells have found a way. What are you going to do? First, I am going to the Museum of Art, mon vieux. And if I find what I seek, then I go to pay a call on Monsieur Cheney. May I see Monsieur Cheney? Oh, this way, senor. Ah, Mr. Poirot, this is a surprise. I'm glad to see you. Monsieur Cheney, you have been a great deal in my thoughts. I'm sure I have, and, and you in mine. Uh, would you care to see my collection of heads? It's, it's even finer than the one in the Museum of Art. But I should enjoy that immensely, monsieur. Oh, uh, they're right in this other room. And while we are examining the collection, we shall talk, eh? Of course, of course. What about? Murder? You have said it, monsieur. Now, now, here's a head I'm particularly proud of. It's, it's the head of a man named Juan who died in a most peculiar circumstance. Some animal had chewed him almost to pieces. Yet you can hardly see the trace of a scar. Perhaps he was murdered, monsieur. Well, now, what makes you say that? Uh, uh, down, Murphy. Stay back. It seems that so many things about you, monsieur Cheney, bring murder to my mind. Even your dog is named Death. That's because he's dangerous, Mr. Poirot. I always think people should be warned. Don't you? But of course. And did you warn poor Mademoiselle Donna, monsieur? Well, now, why should you think I had anything to do with Donna's death? I, I, I do admire the way it was done, though, quickly and efficiently. I understand you have been annoying Mademoiselle Carlin. I thought we were going to talk about murder. Oh, now, now, here's another fine example of the art of shrinking human heads. Murder and marriage, monsieur. I just thought it fair to warn you that I will not allow Mademoiselle Carlin to marry a murderer. Good for you, good for you. I wouldn't want Eleanor to marry someone like that either. Monsieur, I am saying that I know you are a murderer. Oh, yeah. I am also saying that I will not permit Mademoiselle Carlin to marry you even if she wants. And I am telling you that it's none of your business. And Monsieur Cheney, I shall do everything in my power to help Mademoiselle Carlin. Financially and otherwise. You will persist in sticking your neck. And you break necks that are in your way. Let's pass. Sometimes. But listen, Mr. Poirot, I have too much respect for you to, to want to quarrel. I, I'd like to get together when I've had time to think this over, and maybe we can talk more reasonably. Anytime you say, monsieur. Well, frankly, I'm too upset now to be able to think clearly. Shall we say, um, tonight at 11? Consider it said, monsieur. Shall we meet here? No, I'd rather not. Oh, come, come, come. Surely you are not going to ask me to meet you in the park. Oh, no, no, of course not. I don't think you would anyway. Not without being followed by a good number of police. And you would not like that, monsieur. I think our meeting place should be uh, private, don't you? By your means, monsieur. And I have it. There's an old hot dog stand out on Long Island, been abandoned for quite a while, just a few miles east of Bayville on Route 19. It's in the middle of a vacant lot, nothing around for miles. You can see anyone coming miles away. How about meeting me there? Monsieur Cheney, you have an appointment. <laughs> But Poirot, I don't like it. I cannot say, mon ami, that I am pleased at the idea myself, but it must be done. But you won't even let me have Collins trail you. It is useless, mon dieu. This must be done this way or not at all. Okay, okay. Tell me what you want me to do. It is simple but vital. 
you must go to the house of Mr. Cheney and tell his servant Pancho that Mr. Cheney has been hurt, badly hurt. But will he believe me? It is essential that he must. If he needs convincing, tell him that he was hurt because of his appointment with me. That Pancho must come with you immediately. That Monsieur Cheney needs him. Yeah, but suppose he won't come. He must. Or you will be in the terrible situation of having to solve murders without the assistance of Hercule Poirot. <laughs> Down, Murphy. Down. Good evening, Mr. Farrell. I'm glad to see you came alone. Don't stay so far away. Come up a little closer. I do not like the actions of your dog, monsieur. No? Well, I don't think he likes you either. Get him, Murphy. Get him. Come. Come, Monsieur Jenny. That was stupid of you, eh? Did you think I would come unarmed to meet you? I'm glad to see the pistol in your hand. Hey, sir. May I congratulate you, monsieur? You are most expert with that whip. Thanks. Start running, Mr. Poirot. I always like to give the ones I hunt an even break. In this case, monsieur, you are doomed to disappointment. I shall not run. If you think you can break my neck with that whip, I am unable to stop you. But I warn you, Monsieur Jenny, you will die for it. <laughs> and that takes care of you, Mr. Poirot. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Cheney, and sit down. Oh, thank you, Inspector. I <laughs> I seem to be spending a good deal of time at police headquarters lately. I'm warning you, Cheney. I'm holding you for the murder of Hercule Poirot. Anything you say may be used in evidence against you. Oh, don't be ridiculous, my dear Inspector. Well, what is this, a joke or something? If it is, it's in very bad taste. Stop stalling, Cheney. I've got you dead to right. <laughs> I, I begin to see. This is evidently a trap of some kind. Mr. Poirot pretends to be dead Cheney? while you... I've arrested a lot of cold-blooded killers in my time. But I tell you, I've never been as vindictive towards any of them as I feel towards you. You not only killed a great detective, but the best friend I ever had. Before you go any further, Inspector, I'd like to warn you that I'm going to sue you for false arrest and libel, or else have you put in an insane asylum. I suppose you're going to tell me you were home all night and your servant, Pancho, was prepared to swear to That's him. exactly what I'm telling you. Okay, that's it. That's all I wanted to hear. Come in, Pancho. Oh, Pancho. Will you please tell the inspector where I was this evening? Well? Pancho, what's the matter with you? Tell the inspector where I was. Please do forgive, Pancho, Major. I, I cannot. Have you lost your mind? Tell him, Pancho. No, it's not Pancho's fault, Cheney. He can't tell me because I was with him every minute this evening from 10.30 on. What? Yes, that's it. Poro knew you'd try to kill him the same way and create the same alibi. Took a chance and laid down his life in order to trap you. Well, it's too bad I didn't foresee that. But at least I got Poirot. I'm glad you see it that way. Here's a confession on the Moreno killing, too. Yes, I did it. Just too bad, Pancho, that you weren't a little smarter. I'd have gotten away with the Poirot killing, too. Pardon, uh, Monsieur Jenny. Poirot? What? That is one murder you would never have gotten away with. But Poirot, I thought... You thought I was dead, mon ami. I intended you should. In no other way could you have played your part so convincingly. I never missed with that whip. And you did not miss this time, Mr. Cheney. However, you neglected to find out whether or not I was wearing a steel collar. A steel collar? A steel collar. The Museum of Art has one of the finest collections of 15th century armor in the world. I was fortunate in finding a collar that fit me. It was most uncomfortable, but most effective. Poro, I'm certainly glad that you're alive, but don't ever do that again. What, mon ami? Make believe I am dead? No. Hide in my office without my knowing it. It would make me look like an awful fool in front of the commissioner. Next week, when Agatha Christie, America's favorite mystery writer, brings you her favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, starring Harold Huber in The Letter and the Mad Woman.
music for Hercule Poirot is composed and conducted by Sylvan Levin. The program is directed by Carl Eastman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, I enjoyed that episode the first time and I uh, really liked it again. Uh, I, I don't know if we've ever had a more sinister villain uh, on the series than uh, we got in this one. Because this guy was just a psychopath through and through. And uh, I, I really like the way that he and Poirot butted heads. Because you could tell that, like, within seconds of meeting him, Poirot had pretty much decided, I don't like this guy. <laughs> and uh, it just continued on throughout the episode. So, overall, a really enjoyable episode. Uh, I really would love to hear more of this series and hope more comes into circulation. Uh, though I know that's a difficult uh, situation when you're dealing with uh, mutual uh, programs uh, just because there can be so many lost episodes. Well, we turn now to listener comments and feedback, and we've got a few regarding the Box 13 episode, Box 13, tied for six in our standard division. Uh, Joan says, I enjoyed listening to this again, and even though I have heard it before, I didn't figure out who it was until Dan did. Well, thanks so much, Joan. And I'm finding that, you know, particularly when it comes to a series like Box 13, which we did nearly a decade ago, you're not going to remember all the details, which means you can listen to it with mostly uh, fresh ears. Uh, Kevin says one of my favorite series is Box uh, 13. Uh, Bruce says Love Box 13. Was the premise for the story original or did somebody else do it? Uh, Bruce, I am not aware of a specific episode that, uh, of another series that this could have been based on. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but from my experience, Box 13 was one of those series which which, by its very premise, lent it to having some more original plots. And I think that was certainly uh, the aim that uh, Alan Ladd, who also produced the show, was going for. Benjamin writes, a fan of old-time radio, Adam Graham and the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for the comment, Benjamin. And I also want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to thank Jasmina for her support. Jasmina has been one of our Patreon supporters since January 2016, currently supporting us at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Jasmina. And that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Let George Do It. And next Monday, we get our final Host Choice Wild Card. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>